Nice. Uh, thanks for coming to the talk. I'm excited to yeah share. There's a lot of lot of different stuff. I've kind of tried to take a bunch of big ideas that we've been working on and compress it down so that we can cover a lot of content quickly. Uh, but I'm excited to share it with you. Uh, hopefully, we're able to get through most of it. So yeah, if you're not already a member of our community, uh, we welcome you. Uh, we have uh, yeah, we have all the kind of standard social medias, and feel free to follow. Uh, one one uh, link I would call out specifically is like our YouTube channel. So Brent put in a lot of work to creating uh, like explanatory uh, kind of videos that break down our smart contract architecture from like a very high level and then like going into specific smart contracts in our pipeline and explaining how they work. And so it's a really good learning resource and I would recommend you check it out if you're interested. And then we're hiring. So we're looking to hire uh, an engineering manager, a financial analyst, and uh, workplace experience uh, slash culture uh, teammate. So if this sounds like a good fit or you know someone that might be, let us know. OK, so I'm going to start out just by uh, just laying out our, our vision for what we want to achieve with 0x and what we think the world will look like in the future. Uh, then we'll just kind of review what 0x, you know, 0x is so far, like to date, what, what does our ecosystem look like? And then we'll talk about kind of the different stages of evolution that 0x might go down in the future. And uh, a lot of this, a lot of the, the content towards the end of the presentation is like me just like, you know, putting out ideas where I think the project could go in the future. But the future is unknown, and things change very quickly in this space. So there's a good chance that uh, things will change uh, in the future, and, and our uh, kind of roadmap might diverge in a different direction. OK, so instead of uh, explaining the vision for 0x and you know, what we want to achieve with it on my own, uh, I feel like this video does a much better job of it, and it's like a minute and a half long. So I'm just going to show it to you rather than uh, rather than uh, try and do, do it myself. I have something you want, and you have something I want. So we should make a deal. To make a deal, we come to the table. The problem is the table belongs to someone else. So, when we sit at their table, a middleman controls the process, holds our valuables, and charges us a lot of money. It's risky, slow, and expensive. What would it look like if this weren't just a table, but a network? A network that no one owns, and we could trade directly with each other without anyone in the middle. Enter 0x. 0x is a decentralized exchange protocol. It's a set of rules that businesses and developers use to create a network of exchange that no one controls. 0x, anyone can come to the table. This means that if I want to trade my currency for your currency without anyone else, I can do that. Or if I wanted to trade my currency for some real estate, I can do that too. I can trade anything for anything with anyone. See, 0x isn't just about charts and order books. It's about the exchange of value. Developers can use 0x to create marketplaces for the entire world of assets, old and new. They can create markets for game items from your favorite games, or for digital commodities like storage or computing power, even digital art and collectibles. The 0x protocol is open source and governed by its users, removing all geographic barriers and opening the door to markets that could never have existed before. It will all be possible thanks to 0x. Come to the table. Yeah, I, there's no way I could explain things like with that level of uh, video, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so yeah, you can you can probably take away from from that video that we envision all forms of value being tokenized on public blockchains like Ethereum, and that you know through this tokenization we can democratize access to different types of assets and financial services in the same way that the internet democratized access to information. So it's like a, it's a pretty big vision. It'd be pretty amazing if we were able to achieve it. 
Um, and we're working as hard as we can to take small steps in that direction. Okay, so so far, uh, what is zero x so far? Like, what uh, what does the ecosystem look like today and, and up until now? Uh, so zero x is a system of smart contracts that um, processes uh, these off-chain orders that specify uh, the details of a trade, and different people can create custom marketplaces that allow different people to exchange um, all these different types of assets. And uh, we launched the first version of 0x uh, about two years ago. And we were really surprised, actually, by the amount of adoption that we saw. Like, we were, we were thinking we'd really have to try and like convince, like, beg developers to build something cool. Um, and like, it turned out that there were a number of teams that started building like awesome marketplace uh, interfaces on top of zero X called relayers. Uh, and so, and, and uh, we've over time, we've started to see these relayers kind of focus in on more and more specific niche markets, uh, which is really cool because it, it's starting to kind of, uh, it, we're starting to see like this vision of different types of assets being tokenized. We're starting to see that vision kind of take shape. Uh, and it's very early, but we're starting to see it. And so, uh, yeah, these third-party developers, they create user interfaces that are built on top of 0x protocol, and 0x protocol is responsible for settling trades. And in the last two years, there, there's, yeah, there's been like a pretty good amount of usage. We've seen over a million trades settled on the Ethereum mainnet, and over a billion dollars in volume has gone through the smart contracts. Okay, but where do we see 0x going in the future? How do we see 0x evolving? And um, so with, you know, today 0x is, uh, is the smart contracts, it's this message format, and people just kind of use the message format and the smart contracts to build their own products. Um, but one of the things that we've really, we've kind of dreamt of building since the very beginning and we actually uh, mentioned in, in the original white paper, was um, the idea of uh, instead of having these, these off-chain orders that represent trades, instead of having them sit in a centralized database and being served through a centralized server, uh, what if we could like move these orders into a peer-to-peer -peer network that is distributed and censorship resistant and just couldn't be taken down by like a government? And so, you know, it was kind of like the North Star that we would go and build that at some point, but uh, it didn't really make sense for us to try and do everything at once. Uh, and we weren't sure if it was even necessary. So maybe relayers would uh, you know, kind of fill this gap and we wouldn't need the, the decentralized version of the, of the order book to exist at all. Um, but uh, you know, we've been working with a variety of projects. One of them is Augur. And Augur is building prediction markets. So prediction markets are like markets that allow you to bet on the outcome of specific future events. So say you want to bet on who's going to win a political election or who's going to win uh, a sports event. Uh, Augur you know, allows you to do that. And it is important, it is critically important for Augur to be fully decentralized at every single layer of their technology stack. And the reason is because prediction markets are legal in some jurisdictions, and they're, they're regulated in others. And it's really kind of a hodgepodge depending upon which country you're based in. Um, and so Augur has this vision of allowing anyone in the world with an internet connection to participate in these markets with no limits, no, no barriers, and in order to do that, they have to have uh, they have to have a system that won't go down, that can't be censored, and so they, you know, they were interested in using zero X because of this, uh, you know, efficient architecture that zero X offers, where orders are living off of chain, and the Ethereum blockchain is only, uh, you know, is only hit when value is being transferred between counterparties, but otherwise, we're not touching the Ethereum blockchain. The problem is that to date, 
those orders had to live in a centralized database. So working with Augur really motivated us to build out Xerox Mesh, which is this peer-to-peer -peer network for uh, sharing orders, propagating Xerox orders. Um, and so, you know, one of the very first stages of evolution for Xerox that I, I think is going to become increasingly important in the future is the kind of transition from strictly relying on, uh, you know, third parties to host servers and databases for order books and instead also having the option of having orders living in this censorship resistant peer-to-peer -peer network. And so I'll talk a little bit about it. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, so different people uh, run a nodes and these nodes connect with peers and they're, you know, the peers are able to inject orders and propagate them through the network uh, to anyone that is listening. And uh, one of the really exciting things about Xerox Mesh is that it's going to be the first peer-to-peer -peer network ever to be able to run in the browser. And so you'll be able to browse to a website. Uh, when you open it up, that website will load a, a mesh node in, in your browser behind the scenes, and it will connect to the network and start pulling in orders that are relevant to, you know, the market that you're looking at. And so this will, you know, instead of having to download this, this node software and run it on your laptop and, you know, like a, the, an Ethereum node, you can actually just connect uh, ad hoc when you go to a website. And so we, we think that this will like massively increase uh, the reach and distribution of, of Mesh. Uh, and so Mesh is live. Uh, it's in beta. Uh, it's actually just, and we're just finishing beta like right this week or, or next week. And so it's been running for a few months. And uh, over the last 30 days, there have been over 100 different nodes uh, joining the network, uh, not all of them necessarily at the same time, but like joining or leaving the network. And over 2 million Xerox orders have um, moved through the network over the last 30 days. So it's, it's alive and it's, it's starting to, uh, yeah, it's starting to kind of do what we want it to do. Uh, it's, and it's going to be out of beta very, very soon. So Xerox Mesh, represents kind of the first stage of evolution for Xerox as a project, um, but there are more steps. What comes next? Okay, so next, how do we take Xerox from kind of being a tool that the core team is developing and, you know, all, you know, we're kind of responsible in many ways for deciding which features to build and, um, you know, we, we have kind of like a, pretty centralized uh, structure in terms of decision making. How do, we, how do we shift from that to being a self-governing network? So the people that are using Xerox, the developers that are building marketplaces, the market makers, uh, the people that are consuming the liquidity, how do we make them the people that control how Xerox evolves over time? Uh, and, and when I say evolves, I mean like the smart, how do the smart contracts actually change and add new features and functionality? And so uh, today, Zero X, we do have a governance process for uh, upgrades to the smart contracts, and we've we've gone through uh, four uh, four formal governance processes to date. And actually, uh, tomorrow is the last day for. ZRX token holders to vote on the zero X version three upgrade. And so, but, but what does this, what does this governance process look like today? Right now it's, it's basically trusted. So people are cryptographically signing these votes off chain and they're sending them to us through this website and we're tallying up the votes and we're looking at the vote breakdown uh, locked to a specific block number. And so, you know, the community does have, you know, decision-making power over these proposals, but it isn't enforced on-chain. It isn't binding on-chain. So, you know, one of the steps that we're going to be taking in uh, the near term is actually giving the community of people 
that are using the protocol the ability to make decisions in a way that is binding on chain and that we cannot censor. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, you know, we have zero X mesh, we have these orders living in there. The orders are fed into this, this system of smart contracts. So it's called a pipeline because it, it really looks like a pipeline of different smart contracts that are linked together. And um, we're, we're wrapping this pipeline in a on-chain governance process. Yes? This mesh network is purely a P2P network or it also has a consensus algorithm kind of say this all this was like uh, immutable? Good question. So the mesh network does not have any sort of consensus. It is, uh, it's purely like a gossip protocol. And so what that means is that depending upon which node you are in the network, you might see an order book that looks slightly different uh, depending upon where you are. And the orders will hit your node at different times. Um, and uh, we think that this is like the right trade-off to make because uh, you know, consensus is by design extremely inefficient. We wanna make sure that nobody can manipulate uh, the data that we're you know, uh, building consensus around. And that means we have to have you know, if, if we were to have the order book on the blockchain, we have to have like 10,000 nodes all over the world storing the order book in perpetuity till the end of time. And like, that's not a very good use of the blockchain. Uh, it bloats the blockchain. It's also really expensive to maintain that order book. So we don't need consensus. What we do need is the ability to just propagate your orders as widely as possible, as quickly as possible. Yeah, so every single node in the network will, um, yeah, it, there, there are a number of different security measures that prevent DDoS attacks and that ensure that orders are only propagated if they are verified and, and like can actually be filled. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to go into more detail uh, later on in the, in the Q&A. All right, so we have Mesh, and then we wanna move to this self-governing network. So the, the people that own ZRX tokens are making the decisions. Uh, but who are the people that own these tokens? Do we really want these people making decisions? I think that's like very questionable uh, and probably something we need, to, we need to be sure that they have the best interests of the ecosystem in mind. So. All right. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna run through what, what does governance mean like more mechanically, like what, what is happening on the blockchain when uh, a, you know, zero X governance is taking place? Okay, and why do we need governance at all? Like, what if we just had like one smart contract that has all of the zero X exchange business logic in it? And like, every time we wanna upgrade it, we can just deploy a brand new smart contract and tell everyone to start using that instead. Why do we have to have this governance process in the first place? Well, so if we were to use a single smart contract for zero X and tell people to move to the new, the new one every time there's an upgrade, we end up, um, we basically end up, you know, telling every single person that is using the smart contract to withdraw their funds, deposit them into a new smart contract, which is expensive and we need, you know, a number, you know, we need everyone to do it. And so that leads to churn. Some people just won't upgrade. They'll just kind of continue using, uh, well, they, they just won't upgrade. They'll just drop out of the ecosystem completely. Or they form their own ecosystem. Kind of like <laughs> yeah, or there'll be fragmentation, right? So some people will upgrade to the newest version of the protocol. Some people will lag behind for a variety of reasons. And it leads to this fragmentation. And, and so exchange markets are extremely dependent upon network effects. So there need to be as many buyers and sellers on either side of the market as possible for that market to be uh, efficient and, and to allow for uh, the best prices. And so if we have people churning out of the ecosystem, if we have people you know, fragmenting across different versions of the protocol, we lose all these valuable network effects around liquidity. 
So we need to have an upgradable smart contract system. And so that's exactly what we have here. Uh, so we have some traders. These traders feed these off-chain 0x orders into the exchange contract. The exchange contract calls into a variety of other smart contracts within the pipeline. Um, and at the opposite end of the pipeline, the, the uh, you know, 0x smart contracts are actually moving value between counterparties. And so how can we do the upgrades without causing churn? By basically putting in a new exchange contract, plugging it into the existing pipeline, and allowing people to migrate from the first version to the second version, uh, and then having a cutoff date for when the first version is deprecated. OK, so so this begs the question. Uh, back when we were first designing 0x, we knew that you know, we knew that we needed our system of smart contracts to be upgradable. And actually, when we started out building 0x, we weren't actually building it to be an open protocol for anyone to use. Uh, Amir and I were actually designing our own kind of for-profit proprietary exchange. And so the question of who gets to decide on, on upgrades was very simple. It was like, well, we built it, it, we own it, we're charging fees, we'll just upgrade it when we want. Um, and you know, there's a whole separate story around why we decided to build a proprietary DEX and, and move to a, a, an open protocol that allows anyone to build on top of it. But the takeaway from, from this transition was that, okay, now we have this upgradable system of smart contracts. There are people building businesses on top of it, and you know, many people relying on it, maybe even billions of dollars flowing through it every day if we're successful. Well, upgrades are a huge deal, and how do we, who decides on these upgrades? And so um, you know, we thought through all, a bunch of different options, but basically we need to have some sort of governance system, and the only way to really come to consensus is to have a, you know, having votes, uh, assigning people votes. And, and the only way that made sense to us at the time was we need to have a governance token where if you own the token, you are entitled to a vote. And the important part here is that for governance to be effective, those tokens have to be in the hands of users, the people that are using the protocol and building businesses on top of it. OK, so how did that work out? Well, uh, initially, it didn't work out very well. Uh, we you know, created this governance token. We put it out into the world. And you know, the initial use for the token was to pay fees to access 0x liquidity. Turns out, people don't really like to interact or deal with, with tokens that they're not interested in trading directly. So if, if, you're a, if you're a trader or someone that wants to just buy $1,000 of DAI, you don't really care which DEX you use. You'll kind of go anywhere. And you definitely don't want to be you know, having to go and buy another token in order to do, get your trade done. And so the result of that was that after a year and a half of 0x protocol being live, uh, we found that you know, there was very little overlap between uh, the people that were actually using the protocol and the people that were owning the to that owned the tokens and were responsible for making governance decisions. And so that's not very good. Uh, we need, you know, in order to ensure that governance uh, decisions are being made in the best interest of the ecosystem and the protocol, what we have to do is maximize this overlap. We want, to in we want that overlap to be as large as possible. And so how did we do, you know, how do we achieve this? So this, this is achieved uh, actually in, in version three of the protocol, which is currently being voted on. Uh, we, we designed, it took a really long time, it took like a year, a year and a half of, of R&D. We designed a new incentive system within the protocol and with the explicit goal of maximizing the overlap between these two groups. Uh, and I'm not going to go too deep into it. I'm just going to explain it at a high level. And if you want to learn more, there's a bunch of resources online. Uh, but we added an incentive into the protocol and with the explicit goal of moving tokens into the hands of users. And not into the hands of any user, 
And it, we actually want the tokens in the hands of a very specific user. So in 0x, there are you know, three main categories of users. We have makers, market makers, that are providing liquidity. We have relayers that are, that are establishing these marketplaces for, marketplaces for buyers and sellers to meet. And then we have takers. These are the people that are just coming to consume liquidity from the marketplace. And so when we first designed you know, the, the incentives into the protocol, we didn't really have a strong hypothesis around which category of user was most important. Uh, we just thought like, you know, they're all important. So we just want all of them to own tokens. Um, but over the last two years, we've learned a ton about our ecosystem and the people within it. And we've actually identified market makers as the most important user within our ecosystem when it comes to uh, making governance decisions. And so the reason is because, again, as I mentioned before, takers, these are people that are just consuming liquidity, they don't have a strong preference for which decks they use. They'll use whatever has the best price. They don't really care. So you know, they probably aren't going to be making governance decisions in the best interest of the ecosystem because they just don't care. Uh, relayers, relayers, they have some alignment with you know, uh, our goals for the ecosystem. They want it to grow because they make money from trading volume. But relayers also have an interest in maintaining a competitive advantage. And there's a natural tendency for relayers and marketplaces to form into monopolies or oligopolies. And so if a relayer is you know, uh, you know, responsible for making governance decisions and, and they you know, grow into one of the biggest players in the ecosystem, uh, you know, their incentive will be to create, uh, to you know, pass proposals that are anti-competitive, that you know, make it harder for people to compete with them. Uh, and they also have an incentive to uh, own the user relationship. So they might um, you know, kind of eat the entire ecosystem and then uh, they might even decide to just kind of fork off and bring their users with them. Uh, and most importantly, relayers, you know, this is kind of like the classic uh, platform, technology platform or marketplace play, is you build these network effects, you build this monopoly, and then you crank up fees. So people can't leave. There's nowhere else for them to go, and they have to pay heavy, heavy, heavy fees. So that's not what we want long term. We want exchange to be global, permissionless, and as low friction as possible. Uh, and so therefore, we can't be creating a monopoly. Market makers, however, they uh, make money from trading volume. So they want the ecosystem to grow. And that's the only way they make money. They don't make money from fees or anything like that. They just make money by moving inventory. And so, uh, and, and there also isn't this natural tendency for market makers to uh, form into monopolies or oligopolies. And this is because there's so many different types of markets. And, and usually market makers uh, kind of focus in and specialize in a specific type of market. And so it creates this natural fragmentation. Uh, and so the uh, incentive system we've built into 0x, it basically, it adds a small fee to every single trade denominated in ether. And that ether is paid back out to market makers that create these staking pools. And the staking pool, and, and the payout is determined by two things. How much uh, liquidity that market maker is contributing to the ecosystem and how much how many ZRX tokens are staked within their staking pool. And, and so you can dig deeper into that reward function. Uh, but the basic idea is that if a market maker is doing 10% of all volume on 0x, and their staking pool, their staking pool should uh, kind of converge on having 10% of all ZRX within it. And uh, you know, market makers uh, are, they basically inherit 50% of all voting power associated with the tokens in their, in their staking pool. So we've created this financial incentive to push ZRX tokens into staking pools that are owned by market makers. And then the market makers are, are inheriting this voting power. And so they have a lot of influence over the governance process. Uh, and again, if you want to dig into it deeper, uh, there's a lot more materials online. Uh, so yeah, to achieve our goal of having a binding on-chain governance system and to allow the ecosystem to be self-governed, 
we have to have the tokens in the, in the hands of, our, of the right users. Those users are market makers, and with version 3 of 0x, we've created an incentive to um, move the tokens into the hands of, of the market makers. So the take cluster will not have the tokens? Uh, the ta the pure trader and the takers? They could. I mean... Um, but they have to be market maker or not? Or so they have the proportional weight? Yeah, we can dig into it after. Uh, but basically, like the people that are providing liquidity, they're the ones that are receiving these rewards that are paid out in in uh, in ether. Uh, you know, every kind of time interval, which we're calling an epoch. So, you know, every trade there's a small fee in ether. These kind of accumulate over time, and at the end of this fixed period of time called an epoch, that entire pool of ether is paid out to these market maker staking pools. And yeah, we can go into it in more detail. Okay, so now we have 0x with this peer-to-peer -peer network for propagating orders. We have uh, an on-chain governance system. So the people that are providing liquidity to the network are the ones that are making governance decisions, or at least they have a lot of influence over that process. What's the logical next step? Next, we need the ecosystem to be able to fund itself. So how do we, how do we take care, if, if we look at 0x, like the smart contracts and the tooling built on top of it, if we view this as a public good that exists for everyone's benefit, uh, rather than a for-profit venture, there needs to be some source of funding that allows us to maintain and upgrade this system over time. And so, uh, yeah, we presented at, at DevCon 4 uh, a little over a year ago, um, our proposal for how this self-funding mechanism will work, or at least how funding will be paid out. Um, but the, uh, at a high level, the way that this works is that uh, we have these incentives built in to uh, you know, create the ideal governance outcome we want. Part of, those, the, part of that ether that is being paid out to market makers, a small amount of that will be diverted into a community treasury. And you can think of this as like an ecosystem tax. And, uh, and so every epoch, a small amount of this ether will be going into a community treasury, and that community treasury will be governed by the token holders. And so they'll be able to allocate that funding for you know, developing a Python library uh, on top of 0x version 5 or whatever it may be. Uh, they'll have a way to continue funding and, and evolving the protocol to meet their needs. And so uh, the, the uh, governance structure that we propose for allocating that capital is a, it's a committee-based approach. So uh, ZRX token holders, uh, the, you know, these market-making staking pools, they elect a small committee that is responsible for allocating the community funds. And uh, the committee is accountable to the token holders, and they can be um, you know, impeached, more or less, if they do something that is uh, not in the best interest of the ecosystem. Uh, and you know, ideally, since the token holders are the ones electing that committee, uh, the committee members will be uh, you know, vetted, and, and they will have the, the best interests of the ecosystem in mind. Uh, and yeah, if you want, you can dig into this more later, but it's basically how the, the kind of sequence of, of steps that uh, determine how committee members are elected or removed and how uh, capital is allocated by that committee. And so we want all of this to live within a smart contract. And this smart contract will have control over the community treasury contract. So all of this is living within a smart contract. So now 0x, we have this you know, distributed peer-to-peer -peer network for propagating orders. We have uh, you know, market makers uh, driving the governance process. And we also have uh, this pool of communal resources that is continually accumulating ether and that can be allocated by a committee that the market makers elect. Okay, what next? So now we're getting into an area that is like uh, much more um, me just kind of 
guessing what's going to happen. And a lot of this depends upon you know, Ethereum 2.0 uh, coming out. So in a world where you know, Ethereum 2.0 comes out and there are like 1,000 shards or you know, 100 shards, I'm not sure what the number is, the latest number is. Um, you know, people have talked about the issue of uh, all of the different dApps and, and protocols wanting to co-locate on a single shard. And, and that's because you get composability and you get uh, many users already have their assets parked there. So, you know, that shard will gain network effects. And, and those network effects will disincent people from building on, a, you know, other shards. Well, you know, there needs to be a way to prevent this. And, uh, you know, the design pattern that I think will end up being adopted by most, uh, you know, projects that are building like kind of, kind of basic building blocks or public infrastructure will be to have uh, copies of that system of smart contracts deployed to every single shard. And so uh, if you, you know, are using Augur on shard A and you're trading those Augur assets, you're going to be using 0x to do that. If you're trading UMA markets on shard B, then you're going to be using hopefully 0x to do that. Uh, and the idea is that we have this technical standard. It works the same exact way regardless of which shard you're on. And the important part here is that we need all of these copies to remain synchronized and, and to change in the same way. So we don't want the 0x system on shard A to change and the you know, 0x system on shard B to remain the same or change a different way. We need to have uh, a unified governance process that pushes out upgrades to all of these copies in a synchronized manner. And so um, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I gave a presentation at Aricon that discusses how like a cross shard governance system works and specifically how, um, you know, if this, this is Ethereum 2.0, we have this beacon chain and we have all these shards that are um, dropping down off of it. Um, instead of having like a separate governance system on each shard, we need to have one governance system, one governance token. And we need to have a way for that governance system to push these upgrades out to every single shard uh, in, in a way that is, you know, maintains uh, kind of the same behavior across shards. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, I can share out this deck and I'll, I'll include a link to the Aricon presentation. Say again? How do you push out some of these upgrades? Kind of like the Polkadot that they use in Wasm and Binary. Yeah. So it, it definitely requires like uh, some technical explanation, but the idea is that there's this meta model, and so each one of these each one of these shards is homogeneous. So they behave, you know, it's not like you have to have a custom system of smart contracts for every shard. So we create this meta model, and this meta model describes how the system of smart contracts fits together, and what those pieces are, what are their interconnections. And then there's a dispatcher smart contract on every single shard that um, basically pulls, uh, pulls updates from the meta model and uh, translates those updates into the context of the local shard that it's based on. But uh, if you want to learn more, I'll, I'll share the link. And so, yeah, who knows when Ethereum 2.0 is going to ship? It could be a year, it could be five years. But uh, if it does, and when it does, you know, I think that this will probably be the design pattern that many different dApps follow, where there is a single governance process for upgrades, and then there's a copy of that building block on every single shard. Okay, and then, so sharding is exciting because it increases scalability, but people have talked about, you know, the downsides of sharding being you lose composability in some senses. Uh, if you know, if we don't have the pattern that is described here where you have the same building blocks on every single shard uh, and you have like different building blocks on different shards, you lose that composability that makes Ethereum 1.0 so interesting and exciting to build on. 
And you also lose the ability to have kind of synchronous trades across shards. Uh, and so if you want to trade an asset on shard A for an asset on shard B, the, you know, designing a, a decentralized exchange system that allows you to do that is very challenging. And there are a number of ways that trades can go wrong. Uh, and so that's, you know, I'm not optimistic that we'll find a suitable solution for asynchron or for synchronous cross shard communication um, for the use case of DEXs. So what we need is we need a scalable side chain that plugs into each shard and that allows people on each shard to deposit their assets. And on this side chain, uh, within the context of the side chain, you can do cross synchronous cross shard exchange. Uh, yeah, it's like a hub, uh, and and it's a hub where you can deposit assets or withdraw assets from from whatever shard your uh, your local assets are based based on. And so, uh, yeah, there are uh, three main components that are needed for this to happen. We need a way to uh, order order trades that are occurring off chain on this side chain. So how do we arrange these different trades in uh, kind of like a first, you know, uh, you know, in a way where the, you know, trades are ordered according to when they arrive within the network or when they kind of like saturate the network. We need a way to uh, take, you know, you know, a batch, maybe there's like 10,000 of these trades that have been ordered correctly. We need a way to take those 10,000 trades uh, push them into a uh, more or less like a uh, zero knowledge proof based uh, uh, compression or like a, a prover node that will take those trades and it will generate a succinct proof uh, that you know, shows the beginning balances and the ending balances, um, you know, the, the transition between the, the starting and end, ending balances is, was done correctly and according to a set of rules um, that you know, are, are known ahead of time. Uh, and then we need a way to move that succinct proof that, uh, you know, captures all of that information associated with those 10,000 trades. We need a way to like uh, transport that succinct proof into the blockchain and into a smart contract that verifies the proof and, uh, and, and kind of settles the, settles the trades on chain in a, in a way that can't be reversed. Uh, and so the idea here is that if you, uh, if you have trades between assets that are co-located on the same shard and you want composability and, uh, you know, you want kind of the interesting use cases that you have today on Ethereum 1.0, then you can use the local version of Xerox pipeline on that shard. So here, you know, this is one shard on Ethereum. You have the Xerox pipeline here. If you want to trade with someone else who's also located on that same shard, or if you want to like interact with other smart contracts on that same shard, you can do that locally using the Xerox pipeline. If you want to trade for assets that are on other shards uh, or potentially even other blockchains, you can move to this side chain and you can do your trading there and then you can withdraw back on um, whichever shard or, or blockchain that your, your new asset uh, is located on. And this entire system here, uh, you know, this, this verifier contract and this local copy of the Xerox pipeline are both wrapped within you know, this on-chain governance process allowing for upgrades. And so that's, yeah, that's kind of like the ideal outcome uh, and kind of like the I ideal evolutionary path for 0x. Uh, whether or not this will be the path that we end up taking, not really sure, but uh, it's interesting to think about. And yeah, that's all I have. So I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so 
we actually use um, the reward function is actually it, it's um, this it's it's called the Cobb Douglas production function, and it's basically a way of weighting two different um, weighting two different kind of factors or parameters. And so the two parameters that drive the reward payout for each market maker, uh, yeah, is, is first it's the, like, out of all, you know, trading volume that went through the protocol during this fixed period of time, what percentage of that volume was driven by this specific market maker? And then the second parameter is what percentage of staked tokens are located within this specific market maker's staking pool? And so uh, the, I, the, the nice thing about this reward function is that it, uh, if you don't stake anything, then you get zero payout. If you have a bunch of tokens and you're staking them, but you don't provide any liquidity, you get zero payout. And as you, as you increase the amount of liquidity that you provide, your payout increases. And as the size of your staking pool uh, increases, so does your payout. And there's kind of this like this optimal this optimal value where you're maximizing the the rewards that you're getting paid out. And and that's when you know the portion of liquidity you're providing is equal to the proportion of, of tokens staked within your pool. Um, and so to be clear, as a market maker, you don't necessarily have to own ZRX tokens to Put them in your staking pool. You can you can choose to uh, accept tokens delegated by other people, in in exchange for a percentage of your payout, um, and that percentage is is driven by market forces. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'll address the second part first. Uh, who gets to provide liquidity and get payouts? So anyone can. Uh, so, so anyone can establish a staking pool. And uh, you know, at the end of each epoch, the reward payout for that staking pool will be calculated. It might be zero if you're not, doing, if you're not providing any liquidity. Uh, yeah, so um, so there are market makers that are creating these orders off chain, and these these orders propagate. You know, they somehow they find their way to a counterparty that wants to fill that order. That taker, when they go to fill the order, they're going to pay a small fee uh, in the in that's denominated in ether. And it's equal in value to the gas cost to fill one order. So it might be like 10 cents. It might be like a dollar, depending upon how quickly they want their trade to be mined into a block. And that small fee goes into this liquidity reward pool that you know, accumulates all of these fees from all of the different trades. And every single, you know, every single fee within that pool is attributed to the specific market maker that generated that order. Okay, so uh, yeah, if you're if you. So I get to pick then what I guess what orders I become taker as based on fees. So as a taker, every single order doesn't matter which one you fill. You're going to have to pay a fee that's equal in value to the gas pro to the gas cost of your transaction. And since as a taker, you choose the gas price, 
you get to choose you know, how much am I willing to pay to fill this order. It might be 10 cents. It might be, you know, if you're an ARB bot and you're trying to front run someone, it might be $50. Um, but at the end of the day, that fee gets diverted into a pool and the, that, that fee is attributed to the person that created the order, not the person that filled it. So I guess right now, if you're a market maker, a professional market maker, and you want to get as many, as many orders filled as possible, then you're going to want to propagate your orders as widely as possible. And so yeah, you don't necessarily have an incentive to share other orders that aren't your own, necessarily. Um, if you're a taker, then you want to get as many orders as possible from every single source. And so you'll want to connect to as many nodes as possible. Um, if you're a taker, or if you're, if you're not a professional market maker and you want to broadcast an order to the network, but you don't want to run a node, then you might go through a relayer. And the relayer could, could pin your order to their node, and they can charge a fee when it's filled. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think that um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, that's right. Okay, so if the, the network topology will change over time. So uh, you, when a node first connects to the network, it will just connect to you know, some random set of nodes. And over time, it will it'll start to kind of only maintain connections with nodes that are sharing as much information as possible. And the nodes that aren't propagating orders as quickly or, is, or are selectively propagating orders will slowly drop out. And so not only will you, you know, as a selfish node, not only will you, you know, not be sharing orders as efficiently, but you'll also not be receiving orders as efficiently and quickly because people aren't maintaining their connection to you. So um, Yeah, that's right. And I'm actually, I'm not the, you know, you can probably tell I'm not like the expert on this specific question. Uh, that would be Wei Jie, uh, who, who is specifically focused on like the incentives uh, within the network. Um, and he would probably be able to provide you a much more nuanced answer than I can right now. But yeah, I think the answer is that if you're being selfish, then you'll naturally kind of, the network will naturally not like uh, favor you as much if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Thank you. So there is a reputation? There isn't. I wouldn't call it a reputation system, but yeah, I guess there is like a, I mean, maybe it is called a reputation, uh, but there is a, there is a system that each node uses to make decisions around which nodes it maintains a connection with, and it'll boot nodes that are, you know. That's kind of what I originally had. Yeah. yeah. But I do think that um, to start out, like just leaving beta, I think like it's it's basically like an MVP, like the core functionality is in there. And like if there is like a malicious node in the network that's very clearly malicious, it's not going to be able to maintain connections. Um, but I, I, I imagine that in the future over time, um, as we're, the network is supporting more orders and more nodes, We'll probably have to like come up with better ways of like efficiently propagating orders. Yeah. 
Cool. All right. Uh, any more questions? Can take one more. Otherwise, thank you for coming. All right. Thank you.